بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله we're resuming we're restarting the um, Sira Halaqa the, the class on the prophetic biography as Sira to Nabawiya that we were conducting before where we left off in the last in the previous session was we talked about the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, somewhat briefly, uh, didn't talk about him individually so much as we did about the very important um, incidents that occurred. Two landmark events that occurred. These are the two main events of the life of Abdul Muttalib, but they also happen to be the two major events that occurred very shortly before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. So, and those two events were the rediscovery if you will, discovering and re-digging up the well of Zamzam. Because like I had mentioned in that previous session, this was two sessions ago, that the well of Zamzam had been lost for generations. It had become buried, it had become covered. And so it was uncovered by Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet wasallam. And along with that, not only did he find the well of Zamzam, but he found swords and shields and armor made out of solid gold and rubies and diamonds. <clears throat> and I actually had mentioned how he had taken all of the all of that gold armory and he had melted it down and he had constructed a door for the Kaaba out of that. And so that was one of the major events. And of course, rediscovering such a, a blessing as the well of Zamzam was somewhat of a foretelling of the coming of the Prophet ﷺ into this world. The second major event, and that was what the previous session, the last session before Hajj, what it was dedicated to, and that was the attack by Abraha and the army of the elephants. And of course that was the, the, the biggest event of the life of Abdul Muttalib. He played a very pivotal role in that entire situation, scenario. Even though it seems like he just had a very minor conversation with Abraha. But nevertheless that conversation is such a powerful conversation. And, Ab- and Abdul Muttalib's mode and conduct of behavior was so profound at that time that it left somewhat of a lasting legacy. <clears throat> And of course, again, that miraculous divine defense of the house of Allah, of Baytullah, of Kaaba, was also something very important that was foretelling, that was foreshadowing the coming of the Prophet ﷺ into this world. <clears throat> Today we're going to go ahead and get to know the immediate family of the Prophet ﷺ. And then of course, the next session we'll move on to talking about the actual birth of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. The immediate family of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will start off by talking about his great-grandfather. <clears throat> Only because you have to know a little bit about Hashim, the great-grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to really understand Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is somebody very important in his life. I don't want to jump the gun here, but we all know that the mother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away when he was six years old. And then for two years, he was in the care of his grandfather Abdul Muttalib. But even before that, the father figure in his life up till the age of eight was his grandfather Abdul Muttalib. So this is a very important man. And as I mentioned, Abdul Muttalib was a very profound, a very deep, a very, um, you know, uh, intelligent individual, who was also very spiritually in tune. And so Abdul Muttalib had a very profound impact on the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was able to learn some th- quite a few things from him, even in that early stages of life. So to know who Abdul Muttalib properly is, and to understand his circumstances, we have to go back to his father Hashim. Now Hashim, who is the great-grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his... He was of course the one who had inherited, who had assumed the responsibility of giving water to the hujjaj, to the people who would visit the Kaaba from far and wide. He was the one who was responsible for making sure they had water, making sure that they cleaned up the Kaaba, making sure that hospitality was taken care of for anyone who would come to visit the Kaaba. And this of course was after a period of uh, civil unrest, if you will. Quraysh had somewhat of an internal battle. Quraysh had a bit of a civil war between two families, Banu Abd Munaf and uh, Banu Abd al-Dar. These two families within the Quraysh had fought for quite some time over who would assume the, uh, the custodianship, if you will, of the Kaaba, of the Baytullah, of, of, of the house of God. 
And so eventually when this was kind of reconciled, Hashim was, and, and the reconciliation was that basically Banu Abd Munaf was able to take over that responsibility, or at least the bulk of the responsibility. Hashim, this man, the great grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ was the leader of Banu Abd Munaf, this family within the Quraysh, and he assumed the majority of this responsibility. Hashim was somebody who was extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy, and he was known as a very, um, he, he was known as someone who was very cultured, very sophisticated, and he was a man of great respect and admiration within society. Uh, another thing that is credited to Hashim is, you know, giving water to the people that would visit the Kaaba was something that was understood to be a responsibility upon the people who are the custodians, who are the local residents of Mecca, local residents of the Kaaba. But Hashim was the first one who went beyond just giving water, and he actually started serving food. He would serve entire meals to the hujjaj that would come. And that might not sound like a big deal, like, because, but, but it is. Just imagine the expense and the cost of it, right? Like if you're having an event here at the masjid, and normally you just put out bottles of water for everyone, all right? Then all of a sudden, a volunteer or somebody comes along and says, I'd like to donate the money to have a full, all-out, full-scale dinner for everybody who attends the lecture at the masjid. That's a big deal. That's a big expenditure. And so that's what... Hashim was the first one to kind of take on that responsibility. He's like, it's fine and dandy that we serve water to everyone that comes here, but I want to serve them food, I want to serve them meals, I want to make sure they're well fed and they're taken care of. So this is the first time that it was done. His actual name was Amr. This is where it gets kind of interesting. His name was actually Amr. He was called Hashim because لِهَشْمِهِ khubs. Because the food, the type of food that he used to serve to the hujjaj was that they would basically prepare like somewhat of a curry. This is an ancient Arab type of food called tharid. They would basically pre uh, prepare a curry and then they would bake bread and what they would do is they would crush and break the bread and mix it into the curry and it would become somewhat of you know, uh, a porridge type of thing. So this is what they used to serve. This is what the f type of food that he chose to serve to the hujjaj. And so he would actually, it wasn't that just he gave a bunch of money and told a bunch of servants or someone, all right, go prepare a bunch of food. He saw so much honor and distinction for himself in preparing food for people who would visit the Kaaba from far and wide, that he would actually sit there after the bread was baked, and he would crush and break the bread with his own hands into the curry, and literally prepare the food with his own hands for the people that were visiting, for his guests, and the guests of the Kaaba. And so that, that type of crushing and crumbling of the bread is called Hashem in the Arabic language. So he was called Hashem. His name was Amr, but he became known as Hashim, one who breaks the bread. One who crumbles and crushes the bread. And so that's what he basically became known as. He's also credited with establishing a, uh, the basis, the foundation of the financial, economic, business structure of Mecca and of Quraysh. So that even the Qur'an basically makes mention of رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ That you know, they travel in the winter and in the summer. And they would travel to different regions of the land during the winter, and they would travel in the other direction in the summer, and that's how they would exchange goods and bring goods, and that is what basically made the economy of Mecca so viable. Alright? The first one to institute this practice of traveling, having a business caravan go in the winter, and then having a business caravan go in the summer, twice a year was again Hashim. He was that one that organized and instituted this economic practice for the people of Mecca. رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ and there's actually poems that are even written about him. Amr al-ladhi hashama tharida liqawmihi qawmun bi makkata mustannina ajafu sannat ilayhi rihlatani kilahuma safra shita'i wa rihlata al-asyafu. That it basically talks about how Amr, this man, Hashim, was the first, was the one who used to sit there and break the bread and crumble it into the curry and prepare it for his own people. And when the people used to come to Makkah and they used to be hungry, and the people would be emaciated and they would be hungry, he would basically prepare this for them. And he's also the one that established a practice of traveling twice a year, both in the winter and of course the traveling during the summer. So this, these poems are written about him and how important he was to the history of the city of Mecca. Now, one of the things that's mentioned about Hashim, the great-grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, and this becomes very important in the seerah later on, so make a note of this, that he traveled toward Sham when he was still a young man. He traveled toward Sham for business. He stopped by uh, on the way in the city of Yathrib, which we know as 
Al Madinatun Munawara, right? The, the illuminated, the blessed city of the Prophet. ﷺ. But of course, pre migration, the city was Yathrib. So he stopped by in this city, and actually, even if, you know, right now, Imam Zia was there uh, for Hajj as well. So even if you go right now, you notice the stark difference in weather between the two cities Makkah and you know, the surrounding areas in Arafah and Mina and stuff. It, it was 90 plus degrees. We get to Medina and it's 70 degrees, 75 degrees outside. So it was a lot more pleasant weather. Makkah is a lot more harsh in terms of the weather, and um, it really doesn't provide the conditions to, uh, you know, grow anything out of the ground. There's no agriculture in Makkah that's native to Makkah. Medina was a farming city, was an agricultural town, Yathrib, and so it was a lot more pleasant of a town and a city, and that's why they used to grow dates in abundance, and they used to have a lot of wells and gardens. So it was from the habit of the people of Makkah that they would often stop by and rest over in a city like Yathrib. So same way Hashim is traveling for business to Asham, he stops by in the city of Yathrib, Medina that we know as today, to get some rest. Over there he, you know, um, he proposes to a woman, he sees a woman and, and he's, you know, uh, wishes to propose to her, he wants to get married to her. He proposes uh, to her and he gets, ends up getting married to her. On the way of his journey, a woman by the name of Salma bin Amr. And she was from the family, the tribe of Banu Abd, uh, Banu Adi bin Najjar. So she was from Banu Adi, from the tribe of Najjar. So Banu Najjar. Now the reason why that's so important is now the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ is somewhat split. So his great grandfather is from Mecca, Hashim, but his great grandmother is actually from Medina. From Medina. And that is the explanation. Again, I'm jumping the gun here, but that's the explanation why when the Prophet of Allah ﷺ did migrate, to, from Makkah to Medina, he didn't go directly to Medina, he stopped over and stayed. Now there's a difference of opinion how many days he stayed for, but nevertheless, he stayed for a few days right outside of Medina at the place of, anybody know? Quba. He stayed at the place of Quba. And when you go for Hajj or you go for Umrah and you visit the blessed city of the Prophet, of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, you always go and make sure you pray in the Masjid of Quba. So Quba was what you could consider a suburb of Medina. And the Prophet of Allah Wasallam stayed in Quba for a number of days. Why did he stay in Quba? Well, because his great uncles, his second and third uncles, his family members, let them, even though they were a bit more distant family members, they lived in Quba. And these were his family members going, tracing back to his great-grandmother. So now you, the pieces start to kind of come together. So the Prophet of Allah Wasallam had some family right outside of Medina in the city of Quba. And that family was established through his great-grandmother who Hashim married on one of his business trips. So وَأَقَامَ عِنْدَهَا He stayed there for some day. ثُمَّ خَرَجَ إِلَى الشَّامِ He went on and went ahead and moved on towards Sham. Now, what ended up happening was, so Hashim stops, he gets married, he stays there for a while, kind of takes a longer stop than he had planned on. You know, of course he got married and stayed for a while, and then he went on to business towards Sham. What ended up happening during that time though is that his wife Salma, the great-grandmother of the Prophet ﷺ, she becomes pregnant. She's pregnant at this time. Now on the other hand, Hashim is traveling around for business and he ends up falling ill and dying in Gaza, in what we know to, as Palestine. In Gaza, in Palestine, he's in that area conducting business and he ends up falling ill and dying over there. So now understand the scenario. So the great-grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ dies far away from home. His great-grandmother though, in Medina, her homeland, is pregnant now, expecting the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. What she ends up doing though at this time is, when the news reaches her that her husband has passed away on his journey, on, her, on his travels, knowing that the custom and the culture of the Arabs, especially if the child that's going to be born is a son, then she knows that his family, her husband's family, is going to come to retrieve the son. I mean, this is an heir of the family. This is somebody that's supposed to carry on their name. They're going to come to get the son. We have to take our son, our future of our family. We have to take him back to Mecca and raise him amongst us. He has to learn the way of our people, our tribe. He's going to carry on our name. So she's very fearful of letting go of her baby. This is her first child. So what she ends up doing is, she doesn't tell anyone that the, uh, she doesn't send the news back to Mecca that I am expecting I am pregnant. 
They realize, okay, they understand, okay, our son Hashim died away at business. He married a woman, she lives there in Yathrib in Medina, that's fine. But she doesn't let them, she does not inform them that she's pregnant and she's expecting. So now she gives birth to a son, a boy. And what's very interesting is that the name, this is Abdul Muttalib basically, but his name, original name was not Abdul Muttalib. Just like his father was known as Hashim, but his name was Amr. Abdul Muttalib's name is not Abdul Muttalib. His actual birth name was Shayba. His actual birth name was Shayba, which literally translates to as old man. It translates to old man. The reason why they named him that was because when he was born, and as you see oftentimes some babies are born with a lot more hair on their head than others, right? He was born with quite a bit of hair on his head, but some of the hair on his head was white. He was actually born with some white hair on his head. And so when his, you know, his maternal side of the family, his mom's side of the family, when they saw this, they named him Sheba, old man, little old man. Alright, so that was actually his name. His name was actually Sheba. Now, and then it goes on to uh, a little bit of detail is that Hashim had four sons in total. I said Abu, uh, Abu Sleifi, Nadla, and Abdul Muttalib, or Sheba, as we just realized. And he had five daughters, Shifa, Khalida, Da'ifa, Ruqayya, and Jannah. Now, this boy, this young boy Sheba, who would later on be known as Abdul Muttalib, he's living there in Medina, he's growing up in Medina, Yathrib, with his mom, his dad's side of the family, his father's already passed away, his dad's side of the family doesn't even know he exists. When he gets a little bit older in age, you know, of course people are constantly traveling for business back and forth, so somebody from Mecca eventually hears a rumor, hears some news, that you hear Hashim actually had a son from his wife in Yathrib, from his wife in Medina. And we don't, nobody, know, back in Makkah, his family doesn't know about this son. So when this news starts to spread, one of the brothers of Hashim, so one of the uncles of Abdul Muttalib, he actually goes to Yathrib, he goes to Medina, and there he, he goes there to basically retrieve the boy. He goes there to retrieve the boy and take him back to Makkah. So that he can assume the, you know, the position and the inheritance of his father. Now when the uncle, when he actually arrives there, and he lays eyes on Abdul Muttalib, Shayba, when he sees this boy, and he looks a lot like his father Hashim, the brother, the uncle, he basically starts to cry. It actually mentions the fact that, you know, um, he, he starts to cry when he just sees this boy. And he grabs the boy, he hugs this young boy, the young Abdul Muttalib, and he puts him on his camel with him, and he says, I need to take you back to Mecca with me. The boy refuses, he says, no, I can't go because unless, you know, my mother gives me permission, he's very attached to his mother, obviously. So, he addresses the uncle, um, Hashim's brother, he addresses the mother and he says, send the boy back with me. Send the boy back with me to Mecca. Why should, do you need to send him back? إِنَّمَا يُمْضِي إِلَى مِلْكِ أَبِيهِ He needs to go and assume the property of his father. That is his God-given, that's his birthright. He needs to go and assume the property and the responsibilities of his father. وَإِلَى حَرَمِ اللَّهِ And also understand that your son from his father's side comes from a very blessed family, that we are the inhabitants of the haram. We are the inhabitants of the haram. Let him go and live near God's house, right? The house of God. And let him go and assume the responsibility of his father. The mother very reluctantly finally understands the importance of this. And so she releases him to the care of his uncle. He takes him back there and he brings him back to Mecca. And there he starts to basically train the boy and um, starts involving him in a lot of the affairs of the family and starts handing over to him some of the responsibilities that were originally his father's that this brother had basically assumed. Now, after some time, even this uncle who had basically taken him under his wing and taught him everything that he knew, he passes away. He uh, again of course travels to Yemen for some business and he dies over there, he passes away over there. Now, this uncle is by the name of Al, uh, Al Muttalib. Al Muttalib. Now, something interesting that happens is how did he get the name Abdul Muttalib? So, I told you his name was actually Shayba, it means a young old, little old man. Now, remember, nobody in Mecca knows that Hashim had a son. 
Nobody in Makkah knows that Hashim had another son living in Medina. So when Al-Muttalib, the uncle, Hashim's brother, is walking back into Makkah, and he's got a young boy sitting on the animal, sitting on the camel, on the transportation behind him, and they see this young boy sitting behind him on the animal, they figure, they don't recognize him, he does, he's not from their family, he's not Al-Muttalib's son, he's not one of Hashim's sons, he's not one of the other brother's sons. We don't know this young boy. So they figured that Al-Muttalib was traveling and he found a young slave boy and he purchased a slave. And he brought him back to Mecca, brought him back home. So when they see this young boy, they say, Abdul Muttalib, the slave of Al-Muttalib. Oh, it looks like Abdul Muttalib bought a slave. So at that time, Al-Muttalib, when he finally hears that people are referring to this young boy, his nephew, right? his nephew, a member of his family, as Abdul Muttalib, the slave of Al-Muttalib, then he corrects the misconception, and he says, no, this is actually Ibn Akhi, this is my brother's son, and I've brought him back home, to where he belongs in Mecca. So that's how Abdul Muttalib became known as Abdul Muttalib. So his name was Shaiba, but when he was brought back to Mecca, people just assumed he was his uncle's slave, not the nephew, but a slave. And so they started calling him Abdul Muttalib, and that became his name, and that's what he was known as. Now, Al-Muttalib, the uncle, is taking this young boy, Shayba Abdul Muttalib, under his wing. And like I said, he's teaching him everything. He's allowing him to assume the responsibility of the family and his father. Al-Muttalib travels to Yemen for business and ends up dying there. Now, young Abdul Muttalib is now in the position to not only assume his father's responsibility, but even his uncle, his mentor's responsibility. At that time, he's got another uncle by the name of Nofal. Nofal basically usurps all the wealth, all the responsibility, the leadership of the family. He was one of the younger uncles, right, who had a little bit of an inferiority complex the entire time. He had some confidence issues, some insecurities. So as soon as the older brothers are now all dead, even though there's this nephew that's been groomed the entire time to take over leadership, he jumps in and takes all the responsibility and basically pushes Abdul Muttalib out of the family. Now at that time, Abdul Muttalib goes to the rest of Quraysh. Now these are just the affairs of Banu Hashim. Right? Hashim's family inside of Quraysh. There are other families in Quraysh. So Abdul Muttalib goes to the other family heads of Quraysh and he says, we got an issue, we got a problem. You knew my father, Hashim. You knew my uncle, Al Muttalib. And all of you guys had really good relations. You know that my father chose my uncle and my uncle chose me. I now have another uncle, all right, it's like Lion King all over again. Now I have another uncle who's basically coming in and taking over and this guy's not really trustworthy. He's caused a lot of problems in our family. He's gonna cause a lot of problems for you. It would be in your best interest, forget about mine, it would be in your best interest to kind of be on my side and help us reconcile this issue. Let's figure this out. Let's give the responsibility back to who it belongs to. The rest, the rest of the fam family heads of Quraysh basically say, you know what? لا ندخل بينك وبين عمك. We're not gonna get involved in your, this is between you and your uncle. This is a family affair, we got no business getting involved with this. Now what Abdul Muttalib does, and see, again, you see that very strategic advantage. Remember Abdul Muttalib, where was he born and raised initially, at least the initial part of his life? Mecca or Medina, Yathrib. So remember, he's got a whole family over there. So he writes a letter back to his uncles over there, his maternal uncles, all right, he writes a letter to them and says, I got some issues over here. One of his uncles, the eldest of his uncles from Yathrib, from Medina, comes to actually Mecca, and it's mentioned in the narrations, he comes with 80 horsemen, 80 warriors riding horses. All right, all the warriors that they have in their tribe. He gathers all of them together, riding horses, 80 horsemen. They ride down to Mecca, and they arrive in Mecca. Abdul Muttalib goes to receive them, and he, and he says, come, I've prepared some food, get some rest. Tomorrow we'll try to see how we can handle this issue. His uncle says, absolutely not. I'm first gonna go talk to Nofal. And you go talk to this uncle of yours that's, ca that's causing problems for you. So he goes, he finds Nofal sitting near the Kaaba, sitting near the Haram, with a lot of the other leaders of Quraysh. He approaches him, draws his sword. He's got 79 other horsemen behind him who all draw their swords. And he says, I want you to give back to my nephew what belongs to him, or else I'm going to kill you right here, right now. No obviously, you know, can't defend himself in this situation. So he says, fine, I back down. 
I'll give you know Abdul Muttalib back exactly what's supposed to be his, and I'll give him his leadership, his responsibility, his money, his property. I'll give him everything back to him. Don't worry, I swear. All these and all the other leaders of Quraysh are sitting there. You know, the uncle from Medina makes all of them witnesses. Look, you guys are witnesses. Nofal is saying he's going to give Abdul Muttalib, the nephew, back everything that he deserves. Everyone agrees to everything. Abdul Muttalib resumes his position as the leader of the family and the caretaker, the custodian of the haram, and etc., etc. And the family, the uncles and all the warriors, they go back to Medina. Now just a little bit of detail, Nofal continues to try to play some tug of war. So what he does is he approaches another family, another tribe, another family in Quraysh, and he basically alliances himself with them and says that, why don't you guys join me and then we can rise up together against Banu Hashim. My own family has abandoned me. Banu Hashim has abandoned me. They've gone with Abdul Muttalib. Why don't you join with me and that, this way you can finally become the most powerful family in Mecca, in Quraysh, and we can overthrow Banu Hashim. While that happens, and then he goes around trying to talk to other families and other tribes, so he's very conniving. Right? And he's going around trying to build this alliance against Abdul Muttalib and Banu Hashim. So he starts approaching other families and the other families actually say that, no, you know, Abdul Muttalib was mentored by Al Muttalib himself. He's the son of Hashim himself. Alright? We actually, and not only that, but he's got family. Abdul Muttalib's very, he's a very strategic person to ally yourself with. Why? Because he's got a bunch of very powerful family in another part of Arabia, in Yathrib, in Medina as well. We would rather ally ourselves with them. So the more Nofil goes around trying to, you know, re recruit more and more families and tribes to ally themselves with him, the more they end up keep on allying themselves with Abdul Muttalib. So Abdul Muttalib is gaining, garnering more and more support without even trying. Because every single time Nofil goes and talks to someone, they said, you know, really you and Abdul Muttalib got some beef? We'd rather side with Abdul Muttalib, respectfully. We'd like to decline your offer. And so the more that happens, basically Abdul Muttalib's position becomes more and more strengthened until Abdul Muttalib basically becomes an unquestioned leader of not just his family, Banu Hashim, but because Banu Hashim is the most powerful family in Quraysh, he becomes an unquestioned leader of Quraysh. And because Quraysh is in charge of Mecca, which is the most powerful city in Arabia, Abdul Muttalib becomes one of the most powerful men in Arabia. And his leadership is accepted universally across the Arabs. And he's a very, very extremely respected individual through Arabia. So that's a little bit of a history of Abdul Muttalib and how he became Abdul Muttalib. Alright? Now of course, as I've mentioned in uh, previous sessions, two major incidents that occurred during the life of Abdul Muttalib after all of this, once he became who he was, two major incidents, the discovery of the well of Zamzam, which we've talked about in a lot of detail, that, that is session six, if somebody wants to go back and listen to the recording. And then the second major incident was the invasion by the army of the elephants, alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel, and that was session number seven, which I don't think has been uploaded yet, but it should be uploaded in the coming weeks in Allah. And um, so those were the two major incidents. They've been talked about in a lot of detail, so I'm really not going to uh, rehash them and go over them all over again. Now, Abdul Muttalib, let's talk about Abdul Muttalib and his children now. This is where the conversation switches from, talking about the grandfather of the Prophet of Allah to talking about the father of the Prophet So Abdul Muttalib himself, he had 10 sons. He had 10 sons. And it's actually said that when he dug up the well of Zamzam, and he was digging up this well, and he was taking all that gold that he found, and he was melting it down, and building a door of the Kaaba, and discovering the well of Zamzam, it's said that actually at that time he made dua. He prayed. He supplicated. And he, the dua that he basically made was, that, oh God, if you bless me with 10 sons, if you bless me with 10 sons, then I will sacrifice one of them for your sake. I will sacrifice one of them for, for God. So he takes this oath, another. He takes this oath. So happens Abdul Muttalib had 10 sons. A minimum of 10 sons by the way, this should be clarified. There are some books of seer, which actually, some books of history say that he had 11. Some even go as far as saying that he had 13 sons. But the 10 sons at a minimum, the agreed upon, the 10 sons that he had were Al-Harith, Al-Zubair, Abu Talib, we, that name should sound familiar, Abdullah, who's the father of the Prophet ﷺ, Hamza, 
of course, another very familiar name from the seerah, who we'll talk about later in the seerah, Abu Lahab, another you know key name from the seerah, which we'll talk about later, Al Ghidaq, Al Maqwam, Sifar, and Al Abbas. Al Abbas. That's another uncle of the Prophet ﷺ that's very well known. Who again we will talk about later in the seerah. And then there's a few other. Um, there's one Khasham, or there's a couple more such as Abdul Kaaba or Hajal. But nevertheless, these are a bit more disputed. It's also mentioned that maybe these were boys that either Abdul Muttalib had adopted, or these were just servants, young boys or servants who lived in his home, etc. So they were confused as his sons. But nevertheless, across the board, unanimously, there are ten sons that Abdul Muttalib had. The names that I read to you. Now. He, and, and before I move on to talking about Abdullah, the father of the Prophet ﷺ specifically, uh, Abdul Muttalib also had six daughters. So he had ten sons, six daughters. The six daughters were Umm Al-Hakim, Wahi al Something interesting, it's not really... Actually, there's a little bit of a lesson we can derive from this. You know, it, it seems like kind of like an irrelevant detail that's mentioned in the books of history. But one of... This is an aunt of the Prophet ﷺ. This is an amma. Uh, a puppy, an aunt of the Prophet ﷺ. Her name was Umul Hakim. She was actually, the books of history mentioned, she was albino. She was albino. So she did not have any pigmentation and she was born with this condition where she didn't have any pigmentation, any color, etc. Now, that seems kind of like an irrelevant detail, like okay, interesting fact, whatever, let's move on. But uh, the only kind of, um, uh, the only interesting thing I, I see in that is that you know, oftentimes we have so many different types of people in our community. But it's very helpful sometimes to know that an aunt of the Prophet ﷺ was albino. So if somebody themselves, you know, was born um, in this way, then they can find some comfort, they can find some solace, that it doesn't make them some freak of nature, it doesn't make them some, you know, alien, it doesn't make them, it doesn't mean that there's something that is fundamentally wrong with them, or that there was some evil. You know, especially like in old wives' tales, in olden culture, a lot of this type of nonsense was very prevalent. So if a child was born albino, then they would say things like, oh, the mother must have committed some major sin while she was pregnant. And that's why this adab has descended upon her child, and this adab has descended upon her. Right? So they would, they would talk like that. But it's very helpful to know that an aunt of the Prophet ﷺ also had this condition. Meaning that there's nothing that's evil about it. There's nothing that's spiritually, fundamentally evil about it. And it's very helpful to know that. Just in one of my lectures, I've mentioned about how um, Hussein, Hussein, the, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, used to stutter. Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, who's a very important figure from Islamic history, used to stutter. He had a major stuttering problem to the point where he literally could not even complete a sentence sometimes. He would just get completely choked up on his words. He couldn't even finish a sentence. So knowing these type of little details can be very relevant, can be very helpful in this manner sometimes. As serves as a consolation to, to, to someone who might be dealing with a similar struggle. Nevertheless, so Ummul Hakim, Barra Atika, Safiya, who of course was one of the aunts of the Prophet ﷺ, and she plays a role in the seerah at some spots, we'll talk about her later. Uh, Arwa and Umayma. These were the six aunts of the Prophet ﷺ, paternal aunts, his father's sisters. Okay, so these are the 16 children of Abdul Muttalib. Now, of course, the, the, the specific child we're going to talk about here today is Abdullah. Now, I've mentioned to you how Abdul Muttalib had ten sons, and he had taken that oath that when I have ten sons, if you if if God blesses me with ten sons, I will sacrifice one of them for I will sacrifice one of them for God. Now the the mother of Abdullah, the mother of Abdullah, all right. So this is the grandmother of the Prophet ﷺ. Her name was Fatima. Her name was Fatima. Abdullah was one of the youngest. All right, of the children of Abdul Muttalib. But he was also one of the most intelligent, and he was one of the most well-behaved of the children of Abdul Muttalib. And I mean, that's, that's saying a lot. Because I mean, look at some of the other sons of Abdul Muttalib. I mean, he has daughters like Safiya radiallahu anha, the aunt of the Prophet He has brothers like Hamza, like Al-Abbas, like Abu Talib. He's got some amazing siblings. But the books of history, the fact that they say that 
Abdullah was the most intelligent, the most well behaved, and also one of the most beloved of Abdul Muttalib's children to him. Alright, that Abdul Muttalib would always have Abdullah with him. He used to ride around, he would literally walk around Makkah with, when Abdullah was a child, he would walk around Makkah with Abdullah on his shoulders. You ever seen that? Like, you know, when you, when you go to a picnic, uh, to the park or a theme park or somewhere like that, and you see the father walking around with the little kid on his shoulders. So that's how Abdul Muttalib would walk around Makkah with Abdullah on his shoulders. So he was so beloved to him. Now, of course, when he had 10 sons, he had to come through with this promise. His oath, he had to fulfill his oath. Because remember, I've talked about how Abdul Muttalib was a very devout man. He was a very deeply spiritual and devout man. I've talked about this previously. So he said, I gotta fulfill my oath. So how are we going to do this? He was very nervous about informing his sons of the oath that he had taken. Because basically he had to go and tell them, hey, I'm gonna have to basically kill one of you. Right? So he was very anxious and nervous about telling them. But he sits them down and he tells them, and they basically understand. They understand their man's a devout, their, their father's a very devout spiritual man. And if he said he's gonna do this for God, he's gonna have to do this for God. So how are we gonna do this? Basically we're going to draw straw. I'm gonna have a drawing. So write down every son's name on, 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 you know, like a piece of paper or on straws, and then draw one of the straws. Alright? So he does that, and the straw or the paper, the name that basically comes out is Abdullah. His most beloved child, one of his youngest children, his most intelligent, most well-behaved child. Now that's, it, it would've been tough to sacrifice any of his sons, but especially this child is very difficult. He's a young boy. Nevertheless, Abdul Muttalib being the type of man that he was, he goes. He picks up the boy, picks up a, a knife, and he goes to go sacrifice him. What ends up happening at this time is, a lot of the other members of the family, and some of the other leaders of Quraysh, um, such as um, you know, some of his uncles, some of the boy's uncles from his mother's side, so his mom is like very nervous now, right? So his mother Fatima is very nervous saying, where are you taking my son? You're actually gonna go through with this? What's wrong with you? So she sends her brothers. So the maternal uncles of the boy, they show up. Abu Talib, the older brother of this little child that's about to be sacrificed shows up. And some other family members show up and they say, we can't let you do this. You're trying to talk their father. They're trying to talk their, their, their brother-in-law out of sacrificing the child. Don't do this, don't do this. This is foolishness, this is crazy. Don't do this. So Abdul Muttalib says, what am I supposed to do? I took an oath. I took an oath at the Kaaba. On top of, uh, you know, on, on sacred water. Zamzam, I took an oath at the Kaaba that I am going to do this. What, what do you expect me to do? So he said, okay, let's go talk to, you know, uh, some, let's go talk to somebody else. And so, some of the individuals that would be considered spiritual, and I say that in quotations because we obviously know it's incorrect, some of the people that would be considered spiritual at that time were like soothsayers and fortune tellers. So they go to this old woman who's somewhat of a soothsayer, fortune teller, they go to her and they say, what do we do in this scenario? What do we do in this situation? She says, I have a solution for you. Now at this point in time, you, you understand what blood money is, like a penalty? Blood money is basically, you know, if intentionally, even in the older custom, pre-Islamic custom, if you intentionally murdered someone, vindictively out of spite, and you intentionally went and murdered someone, the retribution was you would be killed in return. But if you accidentally killed someone, you know, you were involved in somebody dying, and there was some negligence on your part, or you were involved somehow, but it was an accident. It's not like you walked up and you stabbed somebody, or you cut someone's head off, but it was accidental. Alright, but you were involved or there was some negligence on your part. In our case, what would be like maybe somebody driving a car too fast or something like that. So if you were involved, you would have to pay a penalty. And the penalty at that time used to be 10 camels. 10 camels you would have to pay to the family of the victim of the deceased as a form of a payment to show your remorse and regret for your negligence in the death of this person. So it was 10 camels. So she says, since the blood money of a human being is 10 camels, here's a, here's a situation I have for you. You basically only take two straws, all right? And on one you put Abdullah's name, and on the other you put 10 camels. You write 10 camels. Ashara ibn. All right? And you draw the straws. And if the 10 camels come out, then boom. That's what the gods want you to do. You need to go sacrifice 10 camels. That's it. They've exchanged Abdullah your son for 10 camels. Well, he says, what if Abdullah's name comes out again? What do I do then? So he says, then you do, do the drawing again, but now you gotta add 10 more camels into the mix. So now it's still gonna be two straws, but it's gonna say Abdullah and 
20 camels. And you keep doing that until you draw the camels. So they do it 10 times. Every single time it's Abdullah, Abdullah, Abdullah. Every single time his son's name keeps coming out. And he keeps growing more and more nervous, more and more anxious, more and more worried. Until finally he reaches 100 camels and then he draws the straws. And the straw that comes out is the one that says, Mi'a ibn. A hundred camels. Fine, you know, whatever, it's a hundred camels, that's a lot. You know, I mean again, sometimes we're kind of sitting here thinking, because it's not something that has any intrinsic value to us, right? It's kind of like camels, okay, right? So it doesn't have any intrinsic value to us, so we don't really understand. But that's basically like buying a hundred Mercedes and then driving them, driving them off a cliff. Right? So, right, that's the equivalent of it. Because you had, you had to take a hundred camels, and sacrifice them and slaughter them and just... Then he himself and his family could not benefit from it, could not eat from there, could not take the skin, the hide of it, could not do anything with the camel. It was just charity. It was for poor people, it was just to be given away. So it's like taking a hun- buying a hundred Mercedes and then giving them away in gifts. Alright? So just imagine what that means financially. That's huge. Alright, so he's, he's shelling out money big time. But at the same time, there's this relief. He's grateful at the same time. Why? Because his son's life has been saved. His son's life has been spared. So this is basically what ends up happening. And this is kind of the story about Abdullah and something that transpired with him early in his life. Now, and based on that is why the Prophet of Allah wasallam is narrated to have said in a, in a narration, in a hadith, أَنَا ibn الذَّبِيحَيْنِ Based on this story, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ says, "Ana ibnu al-Dabihain." I am the son of the two that were meant to be sacrificed, not that were actually sacrificed. He's using Zabih literally means can mean either Zabih or Madbuh, but it doesn't literally. So here it's referring to Madbuh, one that is sacrificed. So in this concept, context, Zabih means one that is sacrificed, one that is killed. Slaughtered. He doesn't literally mean that I am the son of the two who were killed. It means I am the son of the two who were meant to be killed. And Ibn al-Dabihayn. Who is he referring to? He's referring to the first one is? Ismail alayhi salam. Very good. He's, the first one he's referring to is? Ismail alayhi salam. The son of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Ibrahim alayhi salam. Inni rafil manam. Inni yazbahuka fandur ma tara. Alright, so that's the first al that's the first Zabih. And then the second one who was meant to be sacrificed or slaughtered was the, was the father of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah. So there's almost a beautiful consistency between this. And the fact that the Prophet ﷺ actually mentioned this, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ actually mentioned this, shows that there was, this is a consistency that is divine. This connection was divinely made, alright? And it was meant to be there. At the same time, something else interesting that you learn a little something about, I guess, in terms of, uh, you know, fiqh, if you will. So, even in Islam, the, the, the retribution, the blood money, for someone who is accidentally killed, and you were involved in that, there's some negligence on your part. Anybody know what the blood money, what the retribution for that is? It's a hundred camels. What did it used to be? It used to be... 10 camels in Arabia, when this incident occurred, when this incident happened with Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, and he sacrificed a hundred camels in exchange for the life of his son, at that time it became an instituted practice all over Arabia, that from here on out, it just, because again, Abdul Muttalib is a leader, right? So people kind of took it as a precedent, that from here on out, if anybody's, is you know indirectly responsible for the death of someone, the retribution that they'll have to pay is a hundred camels. And when Islam came, of course, Islam maintained this practice and uh, justified it. And Islam blessed this practice and then maintained it. So that's why the blood money is equal to a hundred camels, the price or the value of a hundred camels. Now a little bit about Abdullah. So this is an incident from early in his life. Abdullah, he grew up, of course, as, as I mentioned before, he was the most intelligent, the most well-behaved, and he was also extremely handsome. Um, uh, uh, and he was the most beautiful of the children of Abdul Muttalib. Similarly, all throughout Mecca, he was known as like a prince of Mecca. He was known as a prince of Mecca. He was extremely handsome, very intelligent, very gifted, very well-behaved, well-respected, well-spoken. He was very eloquent. 
very extremely eloquent in his speech. And so he was very well respected, and he was somewhat of like, you could consider him the most eligible bachelor of Mecca. When he was old enough to get married now, Abdul Muttalib, his father, the, the, the proposal that he goes and he makes on behalf of his son is, to, is for a young girl by the name of Amina bint Wahab. Amina, the daughter of Wahab. Now Amina was considered, her, she literally had a nickname. Her nickname was Zahra to Makkah. She was called the flower of Makkah. She was very beautiful, again very intelligent, very well spoken. She was very eloquent as well, like she was very good with poetry, very eloquent. So she was a very gifted, young, beautiful girl. And she was known as Zahra to Makkah, the flower of Makkah. So she was the most um, sought after woman in Makkah for marriage. And so Abdul Muttalib goes and you know, gives a proposal for his son, for Amina, the daughter of Wahab. And she was actually raised by her uncle Wuhayb, and they accept the proposal. And so now Abdullah is married to Amina. Two of the most uh, intelligent, young, handsome, beautiful, eligible people in Mecca are married to each other. Abdullah and Amina. They, they, they're married now. Sometime after their marriage, Abdul Muttalib sends his son Abdullah. There's two narrations in history. One mentions that he, Abdul Muttalib, the father, actually sends his son Abdullah to Medina, Yathrib, to do some business. To trade and go and broker a deal for dates. Because remember, Medina is where a lot of dates would grow. So to make sure that there was a steady flow of good dates, fresh dates, right? Um, coming from Medina to Mecca, he sends his son to go and broker a deal. Another narration actually mentions, no, he was actually sent on business to a Sham, but he stopped over in Medina, like I mentioned before that the people of Mecca, the Quraysh typically would do on business, they would stop over and almost vacation, get some R&R in Medina, on the, on, in Yathrib on the way to Sham, and he falls ill and he dies there. So I, at this point, you should start to see also a common theme and a common trend. Uh, the, the, you know, traveling for business not, is not like what it was. It's, it wasn't like what it is today. You didn't jump on a flight and you catch a flight and then you're back home two days later. Traveling for business meant you were gone for months at a time. And you were traveling through all types of circumstances and difficulty and you would often get very, very sick. And people, it was a very common part of life. People would die. People would die in these very, very long journeys. So Abdullah ends up dying uh, there in Medina. And he, he was buried in the house of An-Nabigha al-Ja'di. An-Nabigha al-Ja'di who was someone who lived there in Medina, he was buried there. And it's mentioned in the books of history that he was about 25 years old at the time. So the father of the Prophet was only 25 at the time he passed away. Now, as we know, the majority of narrations and the vast majority of books and scholars, they tell us that at the time of the death of Abdullah, his wife Amina, back in Mecca, was pregnant, was expecting Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the father of the Prophet died before his birth. There are a few narrations. There are very, very few narrations. It is a very, very small minority of the narrations that actually say that no, by the time Abdullah died, the Prophet ﷺ had been born and was two months old at that time. He was an infant at the time of the death of his father. But that is a very, very small minority opinion and position and narration. The vast majority and the most authentic and accepted of positions is that the father of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah died before the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, was born. While his mother Amina was still pregnant with him. It mentions a very, very touching uh, detail here, that when the news of the death of Abdullah, remember these were two young people, Abdullah and Amina, two young, very, you know, like I mentioned, very talented, handsome, beautiful, intelligent, two young people who were a perfect fit for each other, and they were very much in love. A young couple expecting their first child, deeply in love. And so when the news reaches Amina in Mecca, that her husband Abdullah has died, he passed away. She's overcome, she's stricken with grief and sadness. And remember I told you that Amina was a very, very eloquent young woman. She was, she was very poetic, she was very talented, very eloquent. So it actually mentions that she said some couplets out of grief and sadness, mourning the loss of her husband, Abdullah. 
And these are some of the most, uh, you, can, you can feel her pain. And you can also see her intelligence and her eloquence in these words. She says, عَفَا جَانِبُ الْبَطْحَاءِ مِنْ إِبْنِ هَاشِمْ وَجَاوَرَ لَحْدًا خَارِجًا فِي الْغَمَاغِمْ دَعَتْهُ الْمُنَايَا دَعْوَةً فَأَجَابَهَا وَمَا تَرَكَتْ فِي, النساء في النَّاسِ مِثْلَ إِبْنِ هَاشِمْ عَشِيَّةً رَاحُوا يَحْمَلُونَ سَرِيرَهُ تَعَاوَرَهُ أَصْحَابُهُ فِي التَّزَاحُمِ فَإِنَّ, فإن تِلْكَ غَالَتْهُ الْمُنَايَا وَرَيْبَهَا فَقَدْ كَانَ مِعْطَاءً كَثِيرَ التَّرَاحُمِ She says that very, you know, lonely has become the earth. The earth has become very lonely without Ibn Hashim. And then she says that he has gone to become the neighbor. Uh, Ibn Hashim, the son of Hashim, she's calling him the son of Hashim as his grandfather. This was some uh, uh, a way they would refer to people. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself in the Battle of Hunayn said what? Ana nabiyu la kadhib, ana ibn Abdul Muttalib. He said, I am a prophet and this is not a lie. I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. He's the son of Abdullah who's the son of Abdul Muttalib. But they would say this in times of grief and sorrow. They would hearken back. They would call back to the great-great-grandfathers. So she's saying that the earth has become separated or has become lonely without the son of Hashim. She's referring to her husband Abdullah, the grandson of Hashim. He, uh, Abdullah has gone to become the neighbor of a grave and he is out there amongst the noise. Ghamaqim in classical Arabic, ghamghama is a singular, ghamaqim is a plural. It's, it's almost like an expression. Literally it means sounds that like water buffalo or like buffaloes. The sounds that they would start to make when they're being attacked by a predator. So let's say like a predator is attacking like a bunch of buffaloes. You know how they start to kind of herd around each other and they start to kind of moan and scream and get kind of loud? So the noise that they start to make when they're being attacked by a predator, when their herd is being attacked. Or it also in some classical lexicons is referred to as a sound that warriors make out of battle. So you know like when a warrior is in the middle of a battlefield and he's swinging his sword and he's striking, he screams, right? He screams. Yeah? I mean, even when we play sports, sometimes when somebody hits the ball or, you know, they, they, they go up to dunk the ball or something, then, you know, they kind of let out a yell and a scream, right? So it's, it's, it's like they're, they're physically exerting themselves. So that sound that warriors make in battle where they're screaming while they strike their sword, that is also referred to as ghamaghim. Nevertheless, it's an expression in classical Arabic that just means loud noise. And what it basically refers to is, you know, um, uh, Almost like a type of frightening experience. So she's saying that he's not, he's not at home anymore. He's not in the comfort of his home, but he's out there in the wilderness. Because he died away from home. So she's not saying, that, she's saying he's become the neighbor of a grave, but he's not in the comfort of his home. He's not amongst family members. He's not in his people. He died alone out there in the wilderness. She's expressing her sorrow and her grief. She says, Death came to call him. And so he had to answer the call of death. وَمَا تَرَكَتْ فِي النَّاسِ مِثْلَ إِبْنِ هَاشِمْ But she says death has to remember one thing. Death came to call him and he answered the call of death, he had no choice. But death needs to realize that death did not leave anyone else on the earth that was of the caliber of Abdullah. That death took Abdullah but did not replace him with somebody equal as Abdullah. There's nobody on this earth as amazing as Abdullah. عَشِيَّةً رَاحُوا يَحْمَلُونَ سَرِيرَهُ She says that in the evening, now she's drawing this picture in her head, she's imagining the scene. She says in the evening, you know the, the pallbearers? You know when there's a janazah and the brothers, they lift the janazah and they carry it out to, and carry it to the graveyard? So she's imagining the scene, she said it's the evening time. And they're carrying Abdullah lying on the stretcher. As a, as a dead body, they're carrying him out towards the graveyard. تَعَوَرَهُ أَصْحَابُهُ فِي التَّزَاحُمِ and they're fighting and they're pushing and they're struggling with each other. To, to, and ta'awur literally means to switch hand from hand. So you ever seen that? When the janazah is being carried, what do all the brothers try to do? They all kind of come in and they, they all form a line and, and the brother in the front moves on and somebody else from the back comes up and they switch spots. They switch hands. Because everybody wants to take part in carrying this body. Right, and carrying this blessed person or inshallah this blessed person to their grave. So similarly she's saying that they're carrying his grave 
his body towards the graveyard and they're switching hands, they're, they're kind of pushing each other out of the way and it's all crowded in Russia and everyone's stri- trying to get to it so that they can put a hand and they can carry his body to the grave. فَإِنَّ تِلْكَ غَالَتُهُ الْمُنَايَا وَرَيْبَهَا And she says that death came and seized him and snatched him away and took him away and the uncertainty of death snatched him away. The uncertainty, not just the death snatched him away, but the uncertainty Uncertainty of death snatched him away. Because we didn't know Abdullah. Abdullah is 25 years old. He's traveling for business. He's not even at home. He's expecting his first child. Nobody could have expected that Abdullah would die, but he did. But death and its uncertainty came and snatched him away. But she says, فَقَدْ كَانَ مِعْطَاءً كَثِيرَ التَّرَاحُمِ But death should realize that Abdullah was a gift to this earth and to the people of this earth who was very abundant in his blessings. Abdullah was a gift of many, many blessings. So many people loved him. So many people benefited from him. So many people cared about him. And he cared about so many people. That death came and snatched him. And the uncertainty of death took him away from us. And we understand that. But they need to, people need to realize that Abdullah was a blessing upon this earth. And he had so many blessings in him. So these were the words spoken by the mother of the Prophet ﷺ when the news of the death of the father of the Prophet ﷺ reached her. And she was expecting the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. He was still in her belly, in her womb. Um, a little bit of detail that's mentioned is when Abdullah died, when he left his world, he is a leader of his people. And he is the son of one of the greatest leaders. In fact, I forgot to mention this detail. It is The books of history mention that Abdul Muttalib wasn't just a leader of his people, but he was probably the greatest leader in the history of Quraysh. He, is, he was remembered by his people. Abdul Muttalib was remembered as, the grandfather of the Prophet was remembered as one of the greatest leaders in the history of Quraysh. And so, Abdullah was a leader who was the son of the greatest leader in the history of his people. But in spite of that, you see... The, the honesty and the trustworthiness. You know, in our times, if somebody is in a position of leadership, that naturally equates to them having a lot of money. Because even if they themselves inherently, they themselves personally don't have a lot of money, what do they go ahead and use the opportunity of leadership? What do they use that for? For assuming more wealth, right? I mean, anybody who's from any of the majority Muslim countries should be pretty well aware of this. Right? I mean anybody, it doesn't matter where they come from and where they were born and what their father, who their father was, how much money they had when they were, when they, before they became president or prime minister or anything like that. By the time they're done, mashallah, tabarakallah, astaghfirullah. Right? So they, they, they're pretty well off to say the least. And I mean, I, I mean I'm picking on Muslim majority countries. Our country is not even no, no different either, you know? Um, I mean they, they, they charge uh, criminal amounts of money for public speaking and things like that. And, you know, they, they, they serve positions on the board of different companies and corporations. And, mashallah, it's a nice big business. Leadership is good business. So, but it shows you some of the authenticity, some of the honesty, the trustworthiness of these people, the family of the Prophet, ﷺ, where he comes from, his lineage, his DNA, where he comes from, what he inherited, right? He was a sadiq al amin. But these were traits that he also inherited and that he saw growing up. So how honest and trustworthy were these men? I've ta- I talked about it in that, if you go back and listen to some of the previous sessions, I've talked about how Abdul Muttalib, he was not a very, very wealthy man. And Abdullah, the father of the Prophet ﷺ, the son of Abdul Muttalib, who's a leader, the son of a leader, it's mentioned in the books of history that when he died, his, his worldly possessions where he owned five camels, all right, he owned five animals. He owned a small flock of goats, and he had only one servant. And it was a Habashi. It was a she was an Eastern African woman, and her name was Baraka. Her name was Baraka, but she was known as Ummu Ayman. She was known as Ummu Ayman. And she was a woman, again, she will play a role in the seerah later on, I'm jumping the gun here. But she would, she would play a very significant role in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, because later on she would be the one of the women who nursed the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. She was one of his milk mothers. And again, why is that detail so important? One of the milk mothers, a woman that nurses another, a woman that nurses a baby in its infancy, basically becomes like a mother of that child. 
She, she, he can never marry her. He can never marry any one of her children. He can never marry any of her own biological children. She becomes basically like a mother. She's a milk mother. A rada'i mother of that child. That's why we know about Halima, right? You know about Halima Sa'adiya. And how much reverence and respect and regard we have for her. Well, Ummu Ayman was just like Halima. Ummu Ayman is also one of the milk mothers of the Prophet ﷺ. And so what does that mean? One of the milk mothers of the Prophet ﷺ was an African woman was a black African woman. And that's very important to understand. So you start to see the diversity of the Prophet ﷺ's own upbringing from the very early age. So subhanAllah, you see this divine system in place where the Prophet ﷺ receives the best of tarbiyah. He receives the most div- diverse of experiences from even before his birth. Because obviously he was sent upon this earth as Rahmatul Alameen. He was meant to be Sayyidul Mursaleen, Imamul Anbiya, Sayyidul Awaleen, Awal Akhireen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided the most, the, the best, the most optimal environment, experience for him to be able to assume that position and that responsibility. And inshallah, that's uh, where we're going to stop. And I'm going to talk about the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. We, we talked about the death of Abdullah. So basically we're done talking about the father of the Prophet ﷺ. We're not done talking about his mother because his mother did not die, uh, did not pass away till the Prophet ﷺ was six years old. So there's obviously some details, some time left. And we'll talk about it at that point. There's one last thing. And I know, I know the session's gone kind of long. But there's one last thing I wanted to talk about here. This will not take very long. But it needs to be addressed here while talking about the immediate family, particularly the parents of the Prophet ﷺ. There's one question, I personally have been asked this question many times. I remember asking this question early on when I myself was a child and I was growing up. And that is a question about the parents of the Prophet ﷺ. And what exactly do we know? Do we understand? Do we assume about the parents of the Prophet ﷺ? Um, that basically what transpires uh, with, the pro- with the parents of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ in the hereafter. You know, are they believers? Are they not believers? Do we consider them believers? Do we not consider them believers? Do we assume that they're going to be in paradise? Do we assume they're not going to be in paradise? What is exactly the answer here? There are a few opinions, there are a few schools of thought, and there is a little bit of detail to this topic. However, what I'd first like to share with you is the majority position of the scholars. The position of the majority of scholars throughout Islamic history. So 1400 years of scholarship, what was the position of the majority of those scholars? I'll start there, and then I'll get into the details. The position of the majority of Islamic scholarship for 1400 years has been, we don't have to worry about that. That's the position. It's something we don't have a clear answer on. It's something we're really not, something we're not going to be asked about in the grave. It's something we're not going to be questioned about on the Day of Judgment. It's something that does not determine, um, is not one of the key points of our iman and belief system. It's something that we have no accountability for. And that we have no need to discuss. It plays no part in our deen, in our religion, in our daily routine, in our practices. Nothing. If you live this, if you leave this world saying, every time, single time that thought occurs in your head, the question comes up in your mind, or every single time somebody asks you this question, if your response is, Wallahu ta'ala a'lamu bis sawab, Allah knows best. If your answer, every single time is Allah knows best, that will not interfere, that will not impact your success or failure in this dunya or the akhirah in the least bit. In fact, it probably will contribute to your success. Because you realize your limitations, you realize your boundaries, and you leave to Allah what is supposed to be left to Allah. We're not judge, we're not jury, and we're not executioner, definitely. We're neither. You know what they say oftentimes, don't play judge, jury, and executioner? We're neither. Don't play the judge, don't play the jury, and don't play the executioner. We're nobody. In this decision of who is in Jannah and who is in hell, we have no role or part to play in that. We only play a role and a part in regards to ourselves. So it's more important that we worry about ourselves rather than try to figure out whether somebody else went to Jannah or Paradise or Hellfire, etc., etc. So that is a majority position. And, and classical scholars used to be so firm on this position that yes, some classical scholars have indulged, have discussed the issue only academically. 
just so that scholarship had discussed it. But typically scholars with their communities, with their congregations, when this issue would come up and it would become a point of contention or even discussion, scholars would become very angry with the community and, they, and with their students. And they would tell them to be quiet and mind your own business and this is not up for discussion. We don't talk about this. We have no business talking about this. And so that's the position of the majority of Islamic scholarship. However, now I'll share just a little bit of detail with you, just for academic benefit, um, just, in case, just so that you know it's not a total complete cop-out what I'm telling you here. And that is, there are, um, so that's the first position. Aside from that, there are a minority, two minority groups amongst the scholars, who do decide to take one position over the other. Um, the first amongst them obviously says um, that that the parents of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'll start with one position: that the parents of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are not believers; that they are disbelievers. And there are actually a couple of narrations to the effect where the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam addressed a Bedouin man and said to him that. You know, the Bedouin man was asking about his father and the Prophet ﷺ uh, kind of took a pause in some contemplation um, and then responded to him by saying that my father and your father are in the hellfire. There's another narration where the Prophet of Allah ﷺ uh, mentions uh, he was found sitting at the grave of his mother and he was crying profusely and the Prophet of Allah ﷺ was asked what's going on O Messenger of Allah and he says that I came here, this is the grave of my mother and I came here and I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for permission to pray to make dua for her forgiveness and I was not granted that position, that permission, and then I asked for permission to be able to visit her grave, and I was granted that permission, so I'm here and I'm visiting the grave of my mother, and obviously because of being the grave of his mother, he was crying, because he was remembering his mom. And so these, there's, these are a couple of narrations based off of which some of the scholars actually have taken the position that therefore the parents of the Prophet were not believers. And um, you know, from these narrations we understand that they will not be from the people of Iman. And uh, that means what it means in terms of the Akhirah. And, that, and then they go on to discuss though, what about the philosophical question that Sayyidul Awwaleen wal Akhirin, Sayyidul Mursaleen, how could his parents, you know, you know, possibly even as a notion, how could they be in hellfire? But then of course that detail is given that, you know, that has no impact on someone else's, you know, uh, the evil of a family member has no involvement, is no obstruct to the uh, success. So the failure of a family member or a parent even is no obstruct to the success of the child and vice versa. Nuh alayhi salam, his son perishes as a disbeliever. So it doesn't have one, one thing does not have a bearing on the other thing. However, that is their position. There's a second minority of scholars that actually take firmly the position that no, we're not willing to even put this question aside that we don't know and Allah knows and we're not gonna worry about it. No, the parents of the Prophet ﷺ are believers. They are believers. And then within that particular opinion, there's a couple of different um, ways to go. There's a couple of different understandings of that position. That the pro parents of the Prophet are believers. The first understanding is that they were those types of people. Remember I talked about this. I talked about the Hunafa. I believe it was the third or fourth session from the Sira series. That the Hunafa, there were some individuals before Islam, before even the birth of the Prophet ﷺ in ancient Arabia, who worshipped one God. And some of them actually lived to meet and see the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. Warqa bin Nawfal, who the Prophet ﷺ actually went to and spoke after receiving divine revelation, happens to be one of those types of individuals. So some of the people who take this position, basically uh, legitimize their p position by saying, the parents of the Prophet ﷺ were from the Hunafa. They were just people who never indulged in shirk. They were good people, they were pure people, and that's very, very possible and plausible. Allah knows best. Some of the people legitimize that position, and no, the parents of the Prophet ﷺ were believers. They legitimize this position by saying, there is a very, very weak narration. Scholars of hadith have... Um, at length discuss the lack of authenticity in regards to this narration. Nevertheless, there is a very, very weak narration that actually mentions that after the message of the Prophet ﷺ came and was established, the parents of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ were actually brought back to life in which they 
they they saw the Prophet ﷺ, they heard the message, they believed in the message, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them death again. But this is a very, very extremely weak narration. That's the second way in which this position, this opinion is legitimized. The third way in which, in which this position is uh, rationalized or legitimized is that there's an actual hadith from the Musnad of Imam Ahmad which basically says, Arba'atun. Arba'atun yamtahinunahum Allahu yawm al that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test them on the Day of Judgment. There are four types of people that Allah will test on the Day of Judgment. The first amongst them is a deaf man who could not hear anything. The second amongst them is a, excuse me, a, a, a person who lacked intelligence. Basically someone who is insane or mentally disabled. Somebody who was insane or mentally disabled, who just did not have the, the rationale, the ability to be able to comprehend the message. And as we know, even through sharia, that through fiqh, that one of the conditions to be even obligated to pray and to do all the acts of religion is to be aqil, to be of sound mind. So somebody who's insane or mentally disabled is not com- obligated by the religion. The third person is a very, very old person, a senile person. That the message came to this person, or Islam came, when this person was already in senility. This person was already so old, they really couldn't understand understand or comprehend. And the fourth person is a person who died during the fatra. Who died during the fatra. Fatra in Islamic terminology refers to the time period in which no, an extended period of time, centuries, during which no prophet, no messenger of Allah was sent. And the period between Isa alayhi salam and Muhammad Rasulullah which on the dip, based on the different opinions of scholars, was anywhere between five to six hundred years long. The time period between Isa alayhi salam and Muhammad Rasulullah was somewhere between five and six hundred years long. No prophet, no messenger was sent. So that is referred to as the fatra. No prophet, no messenger was sent. The message was not universal of Isa alayhi salam was not universal in that sense. It did not reach many many different parts of the world until finally the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi salam came. So that is called the fatra. So four types of people, يَمْتَحِنُونَهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will test these four people on the day of judgment. A deaf person, a person who could not hear, a person who did, was not of sound mind, a very old senile person, and fourthly, someone who died during that time period when no prophet, no messenger, no message came. The deaf man will say on the day of judgment to Allah, Oh Allah, Islam came and I couldn't hear anything. I just couldn't hear. I was deaf. The The... the the, the person who was insane or was mentally disabled said, Oh Allah, Islam came and the, the, it's an expression in Arabic, what, what it literally translates to is that the children used to throw feces at me, like cow dung. They would throw cow dung at me. So it's an expression basically that sometimes when somebody would be mentally disabled or somebody would be crazy and they would just kind of wander the streets and stuff because you know kids can be kind of mean like little boys they can be kind of mean sometimes. So what they would do is you know they, like they throw rocks or they make fun you know in our day and age they make fun of people like this. You see comedians mocking mentally disabled people and they think it's very funny they think it's hilarious. So similarly kids and boys and they would, they would throw things at the mentally disabled. So so he says that I was mentally disabled and kids used to pick on me and throw things at me. The old man will say, Oh Allah, Islam came and I was incapable of understanding anything by that point, by that age. And the man who died during the fatra will say, Oh Allah, I never witnessed the messenger. I never got, I never heard or saw or witnessed anything from the message. I didn't know anything from the truth. I was never told. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then, the way Allah will test them is Allah will say, Okay, fair. That's fair. All four of you, four types of people, your argument is completely legitimate. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدَ And Allah does not do zulm, Allah does not oppress, does not wrong anyone, even in the least bit. So Allah will say, I will give you a chance. I want you to promise me that you will obey me. Here's the test. Allah will say, I want you to promise me that you will obey me. They will promise that, oh Allah, we will obey you. This is the first time we're witnessing the truth. We promise we will obey you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then show them a fire. And Allah will say, go inside the fire. Walk into the fire. Those who walk into the fire will actually find it to become peaceful and blessing for them. Basically, it's just a test. It's just like the outside door looks like a fire. They enter through it. And what do they find on the other side? They find Jannah and paradise and the blessing of Allah. The mercy of Allah.
Those who refuse and say, uh-uh, I ain't walking into no fire. I don't care who says it. Then those people will receive the punishment of Allah. They disbelieved. They got a chance. Opportunity. That's what life is like, right? That's what life is like. We listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We obey Allah. Whether it completely makes sense to us or not. Right? I lose an opportunity to make money through riba, through interest. But I don't worry, I don't fret, I'm not concerned. Why? Because Allah told me to. It might seem like right now in the short term, I lost out on some money. Because I wasn't willing to do something that disobeyed Allah. But in the long run, it's gonna pay off. Peace and tranquility will come to me in this life, and Jannah will come to me. I will be entered into Jannah in the hereafter. We obey Allah in spite of some difficulty and adversity. Similarly, those people will be willing to walk through what will look like fire to reach into Jannah and paradise, because Allah told them to. And those who refuse, they fail the test. SubhanAllah. So this, so some of the, as I, was, as, as I was mentioning, the minority of scholars that actually take the firm position that no, the parents of the Prophet ﷺ are in Jannah. Then those people, so some of them legitimize the opinion by saying, his parents qualify as the people of Fatra. Because they never received the message, did they? I mean, even if the mother of the Prophet ﷺ is passing away at the age of six, then again, the message hasn't come. So, Therefore, they never receive the message, so they qualify as a people of Fatra. So these are the two opinions. There are classical scholars on either side of the opinion. But like I said, the vast majority, the bulk of the scholars just don't discuss this issue. We have the utmost love and respect and admiration for our messenger, peace and blessings be upon him. We learn about his parents as very amazing, admirable people. And we... It, it, we have no, we have no decision, no role to play in anywhere in this entire discussion. So we don't worry about it. And that's basically the summary of the discussion. So that kind of, I just wanted to tack this on to the end of today's session, that this philosophical or even Islamic question for that matter, that often comes up in people's minds. I've been asked this question multiple, numerous times, about, well, what about the parents of the Prophet ﷺ? What do we know about them? Are they Jannah? Are they, what, what exactly? Are they believers, disbelievers, etc.? Wallahu ta'ala alamu bis sawab. We have the utmost respect for the Messenger of Allah and his family, and we don't even have to worry about what exactly transpires with them. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision. We just worry about ourselves and we learn about our blessed Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so that we know what is the standard, so that we have this amazing, most excellent, amazing practical role model in front of us in, in our lives, inshallah. We'll go ahead and stop here for today. Next session, next week, inshallah, we will talk about the birth of the Prophet of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the proper understanding of the life of the Messenger وسلم, and allow us to become closer and closer to his example. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natibu ilayk.